so much, everyone, for joining us for a lunch and learn today. Uh, my name is Jamie Dunlop, and I work at the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. I'm here with my colleague, Sarah Merritt, also with the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts. And um, I'm just going to say a few words at the beginning about our agency for those that maybe are not familiar, although I'm guessing everyone on this call is. But um, we are a state agency under the governor's executive offices. We've been around for almost 60 years now. And really the foundation of the work that we do in the Commonwealth is strengthening our communities through the arts and the creative sector and creative industries. And we're able to do that through a combination of grants that are made available to support creative entrepreneurs, creative small businesses, um, arts organizations and uh, arts programs, arts and education opportunities, uh, creative communities, which Sarah will be mentioning here in a moment. And um, in addition to that, we are a resource at the state level, being able to connect others to other opportunities, other grant funding with other state agencies or associations, or even things like today where we're able to share, thank you so much, Oren, uh, being able to share one of our grantees' success stories. So what you're gonna hear today is from one of our programs called the Creative Catalyst Grant. And I'm going to put a link when I'm done talking here in the chat. So if anyone else is interested in looking at that opportunity, you can check it out. It is a grant program that was designed to provide support to a new idea, a new initiative, event, research project. In this case, kind of piloting a community development program in the central Susquehanna Valley with the hopes that what you hear today is something that may be possible to adapt for your own community. Because in addition to this being a new idea or a new event, it, there needs to have some component with the potential for statewide impact or statewide reach. And so that's what we're doing here today is sharing what happened regionally in the central Susquehanna Valley through the exchange and the infill uh, PA project. And then maybe that's something that can be helpful or beneficial to you in the community that you live in. As for really no deadline or final process, like many of our grants, it's a rolling deadline. And if you're interested, you can reach out to me and we can schedule a time to talk a little more about the program. And if you have an idea, explore if that idea is uh, eligible based on the criteria. So with that, I'm going to pass it to Sarah Merritt, also with the PCA, as I said, and she's going to talk a little about a program that she oversees that might also be helpful as a resource uh, with today's topic. I'll pass it to you. Um, for those of you I don't know, my name is Sarah Merritt. I am the director of Pennsylvania Creative Communities and the Creative Economy for the Council on the Arts. And I think the, the infill project, um, and the, the reason why Jamie looped me in is because the, the work that this kind of project catalyzes um, uh, really could be a great fit for the Creative Communities Initiative. Um, so just to give you a little background on the Creative Communities Initiative, um, uh, when we were, I was working um, with leadership on our, our current strategic plan, and I spent a lot of time traveling around the state, um, having community meetings, uh, and and one on one conversations uh, and asking folks, you know, what, what can the Council on the Arts do to support community work? And, um, you know, they said we would love to have funding and access to resources. So capacity building um, to, um, you know, help communities with um, arts based and community and economic development projects, which is what the Creative Communities Initiative supports. Um, some of you might know of arts-based community and economic development project as creative placemaking. That's kind of how it's referred to in, in the planning and community and economic development field. I like to call it um, creative placekeeping, um, but you know, call it what you will. Um, that's what the creative communities program supports. Um, this is, the, the grant is a multi-year grant. So a community is in the program for up to four years and receives $25,000 a year to support their project. 
Um, the projects are managed by at least two community organizations. Um, so a strong partnership of two lead community organizations. But if you look at our website, and I'll send you a link to in, in just a minute, you'll see that most of the projects that we're currently funding have multiple partners, some playing small roles, some playing very large roles. Um, so uh, the lead applicant organization for the grant um, needs to be either a 5013C, a 501C6, uh, I'm sorry, or a unit of local government. Um, and the projects must be place-based. Um, and I will tell you right now, uh, I am accepting letters of interest for, the pro for this program. Um, and I'll set, send you the link. You'll be able to pull up the guidelines. And if you have a project in mind um, that you're interested in submitting a letter for, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always happy to talk to folks ahead of time about their projects um, and you know, kind of give them advice. Because in the case of Creative Communities, it is a competitive program. And I do have a panel of experts who vet um, projects. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, um, but yeah, feel free. The website page is pretty robust. It's got some, um, shows you the 18 current communities in the program and it gives a summary of their projects and lists their partners and um, all that good stuff. So it'll give you a really good idea of the kind of work that the program supports. Oh, Oren, oh. you are muted. Okay, yes, I am here. I just had a, a visitor come into the gallery. Uh, the uh, The exchange is, we, we are an organization dedicated to bringing the arts to all communities throughout our region. Our home is here in the gallery. We have a storefront space here in Bloomsburg. We do about nine shows a year. Uh, they are community-based. So for the for most of these shows, we say, here's the theme, bring the work open to everybody. And we mean everybody. So the, the current show right now, it's called Food for Thought. That's the, the theme that we came up with. And we have we welcome work from anyone who wishes to bring work. The only rule is it has to fit through the front door. In fact, I have someone bringing in work right now for our cash and carry show. If you could uh, just leave me contact information there, I'd appreciate it. The shows that you're gonna see that we'll talk about today are one of them was very much on that same model, the site exchange show. We said to artists in this region, show us what's important to you about this region. The infill show was also open to anybody, but was also aimed more particularly at designers, people who, who work with the landscape as part of their career. So Cindy, if you would like to, to um, get the presentation going, Sure. Um, just quickly, I'm, I'm Cindy Hron. I live in Winfield, PA, and I'm the artist. Um, I'm originally from California, but I've been living in Pennsylvania for about 25 years or so. And I've always been kind of intrigued with site work. And that kind of led to an opportunity for me to go back and study landscape design, which I did at Penn State, and I um, finished their MLA program a few years back. So with that, let's see, I will share screen and we will get started. There we go. Oops. Hey, can everybody see the PCA logo? All right. Okay, so we've done our introductions. We're going to talk to you about two projects today. The first one is Site Exchange, and the second one is Infill PA. And just briefly, Site Exchange is a project we did in 2022, uh, about 12 months of production time at Infill PA. We just completed last July, and it was about 18 months in production time. Oh, son of a gun. Wouldn't you know it? I practiced twice. There we go. Okay, so Site Exchange, um, give you some project background. Uh, site Exchange actually was another project a long time ago called Site Omaha, and it was a pub public art project that was supported by the Nebraska Arts Council, the Metro Arts Council, and the Bemis Foundation. I lived there for about five years, and during that time, the Metro Arts Council would ask for projects led by artists, and this is one that I authored for them. 
in this project, artists were asked to create small images of Omaha sites, and they were encouraged to interpret the notion of site for themselves. Um, so we received a lot of diverse perspectives and the city um, sort of depicted in many different styles and techniques. The collected images were copied, folded, encapsulated, and distributed through bubblegum machines located throughout the Omaha metro area. On the back of the image was an invitation to the exhibition of original images at Jackson Artworks, a gallery in the Old Market District of downtown. Now, a few years ago, I was revisiting this project because I was asked to write a narrative of it to be included in Fieldwork and Landscape Architecture, a book by Paula Horrigan and Thomas Oles that's going to be um, published sometime late next year. And through that process, I was talking to some folks I had worked with in Omaha, and we discussed, you know, where what public art is happening there now and what site Omaha might look like now in, in that same landscape. And at the same time, I also approached Warren with it and asked about, you know, what, what do we think we could do here in the Susquehanna Valley? Would this project have application here? And we came up with site exchange. So we invited artists, but we also invited residents um, um, of central Pennsylvania to observe and record through artistic means some site that they defined um, of our region. Um, again, we opened up the notion of site to be interpreted by the artist and we received a variety of um, images and a lot of shared visions of our community. Um, we had to partner with other agencies. We had to find bubblegum machines, which we did through uh, NEPA vending. Uh, we also had to find someone who could do all the printing. We, uh, Bloomsburg University provided some printing services. And Oren and I uh, reached out to multiple uh, organizations that we'd, um, we invited to host these machines. So this is part of that production process. We devised a call for submissions that was written and advertised widely. We also put out a call to a public facing organizations and businesses, asking them if they'd be willing to host a bubblegum machine. Uh, like I said, we partnered with NEPA, uh, NEPA uh, Novelty Vending. Um, we also created multiple graphics and PR materials to help support the project. So once we got these submissions, they had to be scanned, copied, cut, folded, encapsulated, and distributed to what we eventually had it's 27 people willing to host these machines at their locations all throughout the Susquehanna Valley. Um, the images on the right, you can see this is what <laughs> thousands literally of images look like when you're accordion folding them and then encapsulating them and getting them ready for distribution. This is hours of volunteer labor and two days of delivering each machine to each location. This is a view of the exchange exhibit. Uh, we had a map on the wall that showed the uh, locations of the vending machines, but also the locations of the sites depicted. So folks could see on a map uh, whether they live in, in one town, but uh, depicted a site in another town. Um, but you could see all the different locations around the Susquehanna Valley and the Susquehanna River that were a part of this exhibition. It was interesting the way some of these things clustered so Bloomsburg Town Park was a popular location. There were multiple artists who had chosen Bloomsburg Town Park as their special place. The Riverlands above Berwick, which is where it's the uh, park that the nuclear plant up there maintains, that was also a location that multiple people chose. But then there were many singular locations, even as private as a backyard right up here on 4th Street in Bloomsburg. That artist's backyard is the most important place she has in this region. So it's interesting to see from all of these people how we think about this region. What are the important places that we share? What are the important places that we have to ourselves? And here are some views of some of our uh, host venues, the Bloomsburg Children's Museum, the Town Hall, Rohrbach's Farm Market, and Brewski's Coffee and Bar. We had a huge range of host venues. We had some multiple libraries, we had a couple of theaters, uh, a tourist information sites, Montour Preserve participated, so we had both retail and nonprofit types of spaces. And in some locations, these were very popular and actually needed to be refilled during the time that they were um, on the site. And Brewski still has theirs. We actually ref refilled it last week. 
at Brewski's Coffee and Bar, which is right next door to the exchange. It's on the other side of the wall right behind me. They actually sell more of these than our vendor is used to in many of his regular commercial locations. And it, finally, uh, here's an image of all of the uh, uh, a poster for the project that included all of the images that had been submitted. And what's what I always found really interesting was that so many of these are places that maybe we didn't um, submit that particular image, but we know that place. We know that we share something in common with these places. So I really like the way the project highlighted the things that we really care about in our region. Now, Infill PA. So Infill PA, um, the project background for me was that, you know, over many years that I've lived here in many of our small towns on Main Street, there are these empty spaces. I mean, you can go almost pick any town in, in the state and you will find spaces like this that, you know, had a building, had a purpose at, at one time, and that there was a convention of, well, we just have to wait for a developer to come along and put in another building and, and put another retail and another rental space. But you know, maybe, maybe that's not something that can be supported by all of our communities. Maybe we look to, need to look at it as an unconventional approach. And in many spaces, places, um, these kinds of spaces are being repurposed as outdoor amenities, you know, as outdoor offices, as pocket parks, as playgrounds, as gardens meditation gardens, performance spaces. There's all kinds of potential to repurpose the space without um, necessarily putting in another building. And once these spaces are repurposed, they often bring more people downtown that wanna stay and spend time in those spaces. So like Site Exchange, Infill PA had an evolved project description over quite a while. I think initially we had um, six or seven other arts venues that were interested in working on this with us. Um, we uh, communicated with them over several months, evolving that project description. We eventually uh, settled on that we were working with three um, arts venues. Um, part of that is a capacity issue. Were the venue able to put up an exhibit of original images? Were they able to host an informal charrette? Um, we then put out a call to participants. Um, this was geared towards uh, designers, landscape architects, architects, but also community development agencies and stakeholders. So we distributed that call widely. We received um, uh, submissions from all over the US. We also received entry from Canada and one from Vietnam. Um, and the exhibition took place in the spring of 2023. These were our exhibition venues and our um, one of our PR posters. So we had the art, or excuse me, we had the exchange in Bloomsburg. We had the Community Giving Foundation in Berwick and the Art Grind in Danville, Pennsylvania. All of the exhibitions were overlapped or within a couple of weeks of each other. They each also held a public charrette as part of the exhibit. So here's some images from the exchange gallery. Um, we, one of the best things about this project that we were able to do because of the funding we received from the Community Giving Foundation, the Exchange, and the PCA was that we were able to offer electronic submissions. So this isn't, um, designers, landscape architects, architects don't necessarily exhibit in galleries like this, in nonprofit spaces, but we really wanted to encourage a wide range of um, opportunity to participate, to submit work. So being able to take electronic images that we then copied off ourselves, we were able to accommodate a lot of different exhibitors, including you know, uh, recent graduates, students, but also firms and stakeholders. So we received images that were 11 by 17, and submitted almost like as a book or a series of images at up to 30 by 40. So more images of the exchange exhibit. We also had as part of the exchange gallery, a um, charrette table. So this uh, on the table, we had a variety of art materials that I'll talk about a little bit later. We also had worksheets of all the identified infill spaces that were in proximity to each of the exhibition sites. So we identified between two and four sites in each community. We created these worksheets and then made them available at the galleries for people visiting the exhibition to contribute ideas as they wish. Here's one of our informal charrettes in, or in um, Bloomsburg. We were at two different outdoor sites. So again, it's very informal, very low tech, um, uh, one day event. 
Here's the Community Giving Foundation in Berwick. We did the exhibit, kind of a makeshift exhibit in their lobby. And then we had the informal charrette in the adjacent conference room. This is the art grind exhibit in their gallery space. And then as we received contributions from the informal charrettes, we also concluded them as part of the exhibit. So we kind of grew the exhibit as the, um, as the time went on. Now I'm gonna show you some, just a, a small smattering of um, submissions that we received. Uh, this one is from Montreal. And this is looking at a, uh, an infill space that, that they've turned into a public plaza. So this is kind of the after image on the left and then the process on the right. This is a submission by Salt Design out of Philadelphia, looking at an infill space. They worked with a partner um, social service organization to design a space that would be um, used by children and adults alike. They introduced some native plantings. They held community um, engagement activities to get feedback from the community so that this design could evolve and be a space that um, uh, was empowered through that partnership and community development activities. Uh, this is a, a former a student of Penn State and actually a recent graduate of the Harvard Design School. She was looking at a space in Pittsburgh that um, was kind of an underutilized uh, park and a desired parking lot for the, um, the ballet that's across the street from this facility. So she was able to look at this space and over a phased approach, turn it from parking into more of a park that could be activated through performance. Uh, the before image on the upper left uh, with a quick kind of drawing uh, showing this space being transformed into both a uh, parking and cafe and a workspace and also a charging station. Excuse me, I think this one is actually the charging station and bike parking. But you can see artists and designers use different kinds of techniques and materials to illustrate what they're trying to convey as well as creating diagrams and um, text to help back up their ideas. Now, this is a project in Meadville, Pennsylvania. You can see the before images on the left and the conceptual design in the upper right. And then the project progress in the lower right. This is a project that included uh, stormwater best practices and placemaking, as well as solar panels to help create some um, sort of little workstations uh, for people to plug in and uh, be outside while they're working. Uh, Sandy, just really quick for everybody. Um, this project is actually a pilot community of the Creative Communities Initiative, and okay. they just dedicated the park two weeks ago. So it's finished. So um, if anybody wants to see what it looks like finished, I'm happy to share that. Thanks, thanks for bringing that up. I did have a note that this was a PAC grant piece. I appreciate you make, mentioning that. A little closer to home, Woodland Designs. This is a project in Homesdale. Um, they're creating river walk access. And this is an example of a diagram and, and drawings when something is going towards implementation. So we've moved away just from conceptual design into what, what is the actual process gonna be? The images on the right tell you a little bit more about the concept and what that, that access is gonna look like, but that upper left image starts to tell you how we're gonna break this space down and really build this piece. There's lots of different ways to convey ideas. This is the same organization, Woodland Designs. This is a riverfront park uh, in Dixon City. This is a former industrial site. And um, Sarah, I don't know if you mentioned Dixon City is, is one of your creative communities too. Yeah, they just came in. The next three examples are from the Ken Smith Workshop. Uh, this is a, a project in New Orleans. This is a post-Katrina recovery program. And they were working with um, repurposing materials that were gathered from the neighborhood to create this pocket park, part of their global green program of the planters company. This is a community garden in Brooklyn and it was designed as part of the New York recovery program. 
So again, we have an example of what the model looked like, what the before images looked like, and the after images, all as part of a, um, a design poster. And this is uh, PS19 in Queens. This is an example of um, creating a very colorful plan. This is the kind of work that can be done very inexpensively and very quickly to completely transform the understanding of a space. So you see the before images on the lower right, and then the very colorful um, result in the center. This project was submitted um, by a designer from uh, Vietnam, and I was really impressed with it because one, he gave us the whole iterative process in multiple pages. And also he chose to work with a, a small site in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. So he took the time to really look at where we were at and what we might need and, and then create and, and generate this really lovely image that is, a, um, is, is, is meant to be temporary shelters, um, the, in response to the COVID pandemic that can transition over time into outdoor exhibition space. This is my very favorite project because it's it's incredibly beautiful and it's right here. It's, it's just a, a few hundred feet down the street from where I'm sitting right now. And I would build this in a heartbeat if we could. And um, while we had many submissions, um, this is the last of the group um, that I have on the slides. Um, this is my contribution. I've been doing a project called 50% where I've been looking at how to transform 50% of a hardscape of defunct spaces for the benefit of outdoor recreation. So these are two shopping malls, both in Michigan, one in Harper Woods and one in Sterling Heights. And they, they're they personal to me. These are spaces I can remember my mother taking me as a child. Um, and they've since become underutilized and yet it's acres and acres of asphalt. So looking at... Um, um, well, I'm a big fan of E.O. Wilson and his book, The Half Earth Project, talked about setting aside literally half the earth. So when I look at design potential, I sometimes think, well, what if I took away half of the hardscape and we revegetated, what could that become? So these are two pieces from that project, and that was my contribution to the exhibit. Now, to facilitate uh, visitors participating in the exhibit, we created tear sheets. And to do that, the first thing we did was we identified uh, infill sites in each of the communities where there was going to be an exhibit. You know, this meant just walking the community, um, identifying the sites, taking feedback from um, the, the management of each of the arts venues. We then used uh, Google Earth, but you could use Google Street Maps to locate the site. Those softwares offer some, um, you know, ways to measure the site or get some basic understanding of the scale. Um, I then took it into Adobe Illustrator and created the illustration on the far right, just kind of showing what the site boundaries are on approximate um, uh, scale. Um, we then added our, our, uh, our, our infill description and uh, made these available widely. So they were 11 by 17, you know, copied uh, quickly and people could um, then draw, write, or otherwise just uh, talk about what they would like to see in these sites. So we did that for each of our venues. Here's three of them from Bloomsburg. We did a perspective and a plan uh, view for each of these spaces. And then we also did the alley, which I want to let Al uh, uh, Oren talk about a little bit. It was really apropos. The, the alleyway had been in the design process for a very long time, but has recently come into its own. So if you want to share some more about that process, Oren. This is a, it's, it's, right around the corner from the exchange it had been used as a street so this was a a space that cars were driving from main street to the parking lots and back but it was also the connection for pedestrians from that parking lot onto main street plainly dangerous we identified as the downtown organization years ago that this would be an ideal spot to close the street and turn it into a park we worked with the town and the adjacent property owners got community development block grant funding to go towards this. And then it was actually before COVID, one of the property owners decided that this was a bad idea and should fight it. Because of COVID and that controversy, things dragged and dragged and dragged. And finally, uh, I guess it was early this year, the town council decided that they simply couldn't wait any longer. They had money that they needed to spend and it should get devoted to other projects. The two property owners who were still in favor of this 
continue to work with the downtown organization, the town did vacate this alley. So they no longer had a claim to it as a right of way. And we closed it off this spring. The photographs that you're seeing here are just the very beginning of the process. The planters that went in were put in as to, to block the any car access. But since these have have gone in, we actually put in a curb on Main Street. So it is now a it is permanently closed. You cannot drive into the space from the upper end. And on the brick wall that you see, the, the red brick wall, we have put up both uh, panels that will be for murals and also green screens for planters. As of a week and a half ago, we now actually have the plants in place. And next spring, we'll see them come up and fill this space. There are also string lights across the top. So the space is well lit all night long, welcoming, and we see it well used. The, the project for all of the bumps in the road to get here, it's already been an enormous plus for our downtown. Absolutely. Um, these were the uh, infill worksheets we, we produced for Berwick. Um, the selections made for Berwick included the former Kmart parking lot and another site along Market Street. And this gives you an example of what we can, we provided a perspective view and a plan view of each site that was selected. And in Berwick, we had a, a community member um, make a contribution, a, a submission to the process. And she reached out to the Berwick Arts Association and to a local landscaper. And together, they looked at one of those sites that they want to see transformed and produced this as their submission. So folks really do care about these spaces. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really happy and proud that a project like Intel PA spurred her on to make those connections and develop this as a project to submit just for this project, you know. Um, and for Danville, we had a, a corner space. Again, we, we show a, a perspective and a, um, a plan view. Uh, the corner space is often used for seasonal um, holiday tree sales, but um, the rest of the year, it kind of it doesn't have a lot going on. There's an alleyway space um, in Danville, not unlike the space in Bloomsburg. And in Danville, in another one of their infill spaces, they have recently um, uh, changed. You can see the before image in the upper left, the plan in the center, and then the after image. Um, it's, it's a little more evolved since that after image was taken, but you can see the, um, the design, the conceptual plans um, down below. So they designed the space to be a um, performance space. And finally, I'll, I'll talk to you about the Shred Kit. <clears throat> I'm a former art teacher, and um, I really like getting people involved in the creative process. I do know that sometimes when people come to these meetings, they, you know, the thought of like drawing or writing or contributing, they get all nervous. They, they don't want to talk. So sometimes they might be more comfortable doodling or drawing. Um, if they don't feel comfortable with drawing, they could put stamps. If um, if they don't want to do the things, they could use um, the templates to draw and trace or they could write on post-its. We had a variety of materials available so that there was a little bit of something for everyone as, as best we could. And the more we know, the more we can accommodate differences in how people like to participate. Just quickly, I was sitting at one of these informal uh, charrettes outdoors and there was this young woman who I saw her all day long walking back and forth. And then I realized she's a delivery person. So that's why I saw her so many times during the day. And I was cleaning up the space at the end of the day. She just shouted out to me. She says, I want it to be a dog park, you know? <laughs> so although she didn't come over to the table and, and, and didn't film the drawing, she knew we were doing something that had to do with the, the thoughts about this space. And she had a desire. She really wanted it to be something and she wanted to be heard. It doesn't necessarily mean she needed to have to come over and do something, but it is available. So that was part of the development of the shred kit so that we had something um, uh, for as many different types, even if they're just curious about the art materials, they just come in and fuss around. But we also did a charrette kit for kids. We had um, uh, some of the people that we visited with as we developed this project talked about um, taking these projects to high schoolers, for example, or after school programs and having kids um, think about design, <clears throat> excuse me, of the, some of their own spaces. And then these images that happened as part of the informal shreds became part of the exhibit. So here's some uh, views again of the exchange gallery with some contributions um, from visitors. And then here's some more details. 
and a few more. And I think that's my last slide and we can open it up to discussion. It was gratifying from our end to see the broad range of people who participated in this, not only at the at the charrettes, but the people who submitted work we had from designers, as Cindy said, around the country and around the world, and also local people. This got them thinking about, about their spaces. The, these are spaces that we walk past every day, in general, don't even consider that there are possibilities. But if you say to people, hey, you know, there's a space over there that you 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 could have a say in what this becomes, it's not that hard to get people to care. I just wanted to say so, thank you, Cindy and Oren. I'm so sorry. Uh, that was a really wonderful presentation. And uh, just wanted to say thanks for sharing that. I hope it's helpful for folks. Sorry, Brad, go ahead. No, no problem. So I was going to say, or I think uh, you guys have hit on a, a topic here that I think is tremendously valuable to share with people because every borough downtown has a dozen or more of these kind of spaces you know no matter how good you are in your downtown you've got a handful of vacant lots or infill spaces to deal with and you know like we're looking at one right now that um we've been over and over again looking to try to develop this site and we just can't make it work and just a few months ago, we finally said, you know what, maybe we should just make this into a pocket park and just not beat our heads against the wall to try to, you know, build an office building or, a, you know, a, a residential building when the numbers are just so far um, apart. So uh, I appreciate, you, you know, this, you don't see people focus on this type of issue very often. So I appreciate the teamwork on this and thank my, uh, my colleague, Alice Ann, again, for uh, sending this my way. The two spaces on Main Street that we had the tear sheets for, where, where we did our, our charrettes, the one was the result of a fire in 2009, and the other was the result of a fire in 2003. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at 20 yeah. years of empty space. Yeah, and, and just to amplify that, that is not unusual. I'll bet you every one of our communities in this state has a handful of, of spaces like that, that they could say two or three or more decades have gone by um, where, you know, nothing's happened. <laughs> yeah. So it's just I, emblematic I of these kinds of spaces. I a lot of those communities, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll bet you do. Uh, so, um, but I guess I, what I would say too, is I think what's really awesome about this project, and I was so excited when Jamie told me about it, was, um, that um, it really highlights the importance of community engagement, right? It's not, it doesn't, it can't be just five people sitting around the coffee shop deciding what happens with these spaces. It has to be community driven. Um, and that's a, high, a key um, component of the Creative Communities Initiative and what it funds. And I think what's really great about this is because, you know, you hear about these kind of projects that, ha that happen in communities, but I really love how Cindy, how you like, and Oren, how you folks have laid it all out and given the steps, right? So it's there as a tool that communities can use. And it's just so creatively done and authentic that I applaud you for this. I think it's really wonderful. Thanks. Thanks. And, and I want to point out and, and back a little bit about what, what Brad was saying is that these interactions don't have to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. They can be yep. very low tech, very low budget transitions that can make a huge difference in how we understand that space. You know, a lot of these spaces, they get blight because they seem like no one cares about them and they're unprogrammed. When we apply a program to them, even if that program is just laying in a new paint job, you know, over an underutilized uh, uh, asphalt or something, suddenly we see that space with new eyes. Yep. I just want to add that, uh, Cindy, that comment that you just made about it doesn't have to be high tech or a high cost to have that level of engagement. I think that your approach makes it more accessible too. I think that more people of 
uh, from the community, different ages and so forth, are able to engage um, in a process like that versus if it was the other. So, yeah, I think it's great. What we saw in some of the submitters' work and what I often see in landscape architecture are phased approaches. So there's also like a stepping stone approach where there might be a group who really wants the place to be an X, but someone else wants it to be a Y. And then you don't have to have either or, but you might try different things out in a very low tech kind of way. And then again, get your feedback again and say, oh, you know, you're right. This really does work better for an outdoor office than for a playscape, for example. And those kind of decisions can be made as you try different things out on a low uh, budget or low tech kind of way and just bring in that feedback constantly. Landscape architecture and transition like this are inherently interdisciplinary. So while as, a, as with my arts background, I really appreciate the kinds of designs that were submitted because I just think they're so incredibly beautiful. I understand that they have to work with social service agencies and all the stakeholders, the people of the place, technicians that can help them understand how these things that they'd like to see can happen. You know, maybe they have a drainage issue or a lighting issue that we need special expertise for. So it's inherently interdisciplinary and therefore really needs partnerships to be able to pull it off successfully. I was curious um, how uh, you mentioned, you know, that you had submissions um, not only from across the country, but worldwide. Um, is there a, a way that you attribute getting that visibility? Several weekends of I, the American Society of Landscape Architects allowed me to um, uh, distribute the call through their um, social media. Um, there was a couple of subsets uh, within their system of communications. The um, um, Architects Institute of America allowed me to advertise on their website. There was a sculpture um, uh, art calls that I submitted to. I contacted every state uh, uh, version of ASLA and they all put it out to their membership. I contacted individual um, uh, firms across the country, as well as college program uh, of landscape architecture, uh, uh, their chairs of their programs to distribute to students or faculty who might be interested. Um, there was a couple of art calls that are sort of general that I distributed it through. It was many, many weekends of just, who can I send this out to now? Great. Well, I should also point out, just to back that up, is that su submitting was free. There was no fee to participate. Many art calls do have a fee. That's not good. So there was no fee to participate, and we made it the electronic submission process, which made it really simple for people to participate who normally don't show their work in this way. You know, as artists, I'm used to having to, you know, schlep my stuff here and there. But for designers, this is not like a, a regular kind of thing. So to encourage them to participate in an arts venue exhibition, we went through that process. We're able to, to um, get the funding to offer electronic submissions. And that I think that made it more accessible. We're, we're very fortunate here, just outside of town in Bloomsburg, we have a print shop that is used to doing blueprints and other large format work for architects and designers. And they also happened to do it at a very reasonable price. So as all of these submissions came in, we collated them into a Google Drive and then were able to send a uh, send those files up to that printing company. A couple of days later, they had a huge stack of stuff that we then divided among the three venues. I just wanted to say that I put uh, Sarah and I both put links to the programs that we referenced today, the Creative Communities Program, the Creative Catalyst Program. They're both in the chat. And I just put my email address in there as well. If you had any follow-up questions about you know, the funding related to today's topic or want to know more about the Creative Communities Initiative, feel free to reach out to us. We're really excited about things that are happening across the state and the uh, really like local focused efforts that are happening for this 
grassroots approach. It really aligns with what we are trying to do as a state agency, agency excuse me, which is strengthening communities through the arts, as our tagline says. So um, we're happy to talk if we can be of any help connecting you to resources through us or certainly resources through, you know, there are regional Department of Community and Economic Development offices across the state. Uh, they have resources as well through their grant programs. And just wanted to again say thank you, Oren, for hosting today, Cindy and Oren, both of you for presenting and, and putting this project together. It's really wonderful and um, I think very inspiring. Thank you. Mm -hmm.